Poland reborn and the dream is alive. President Bush goes to Gdansk, birthplace of solidarity's freedom drive for Poland. Then he flies to Budapest to see the winds of change sweeping Hungary. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting tonight from Budapest, Hungary. Good evening. Now, here in Budapest and earlier in Gdansk, a pivotal day in President Bush's campaign to help Eastern Europe break away from one-party communist rule and Marxist economics. The day's moving and fast-moving events began in Gdansk, Poland. It was everything Warsaw wasn't. On the road to Gdansk, where Solidarity first came out of the shipyards to inspire a nation, the crowds for George Bush weren't just warm. They were, compared with those in Warsaw, big. Everyone seemed to know the importance of George Bush coming to the private home of Lech Wałęsa for one-on-one -on -one talks over lunch. How are you? Oh, nice to see you again. As President and Mrs. Bush are greeted by Mrs. Wałęsa and Lech Wałęsa, one is reminded that in many ways, this house where Lech Wałęsa lives, where President Bush is visiting today, is the center of Poland. Nearly everybody believes that the government won't last. Nobody knows what's going to happen to the Communist Party, but nearly everybody figures that the one constant that has the best chance of lasting is the Bowensis who live here. Lunch with Bowensa meant serious talk at the table. Bowensa didn't complain about the modest aid package Mr. Bush proposed yesterday. Bowensa emphasized his own proposal. The two men emerged for a walk in the garden, but Wentz is saying what he wants is U.S. banks to put up $10 billion in private investment money to jumpstart and transform Poland's economy. President Bush called it a new idea, a proposal worth considering. Close by the Bowensa house, the Miaszewskis are getting ready for this day. He, a pediatrician, she, an assistant law professor, both members of Solidarity. They want the children to take part today Hello. and to remember. Hello, Bush. Mm. <laughs> a Solidarity pen for their daughter, and it's off to see and hear George Bush and Lech Wałęsa. At the Lenin shipyards in 1970, then the electrician Lech Wałęsa led an effort to form an independent union. Dozens of strikers were killed following him. In their memory, Bowensa built this memorial, the three dark gray shafts. He built it in defiance of the law, and for that, Bowensa went to prison. It's been a long, tough, dangerous road from then to now. It was here that George Bush delivered the emotional high point. To those who think that freedom can be forever denied, I say, let them look at Poland. And to those who think that dreams can be forever repressed, I say, look, let them look at Poland, for here in Poland, the dream is alive. And this was the line that drew the most applause. And the brave workers of Gdansk know Poland is not alone. America stands with you. Long live Bush, long live Bush, they chant. <laughs> the Miaszewski family watch George Bush today, are watching their world change before their eyes. This was George Bush's event, but this is Lech Wałęsa's day. We have a chance, Wałęsa says, to be the America of the East. Lightning hit Budapest just before President Bush did this evening. White House correspondent Leslie Stahl picks up our coverage of the Bush's rain-swept evening here in Budapest. Just before President Bush got to downtown Budapest, a thunderstorm with violent winds hit the city. But thousands stayed on to cheer him at Kossuth Square, where the 1956 uprising against Soviet domination began. 
Mr. Bush tore up his prepared text and spoke of off the cuff. That we must work with Hungary. We want to work with Hungary to continue the changes and the reforms that are going forward in your great country as of today. The president plunged into the crowd of soggy fans, stunning one of them by giving her his raincoat. Hungary is very different from Poland. The stores here are filled with consumer goods, there's ample food, and reform has come from within the Communist Party, which itself is promoting private enterprise. But like Poland, there's high inflation, a large foreign debt, and like the Poles, the Hungarians are looking to President Bush for economic aid. But he is bringing a similar package to the one he brought the Poles, short on direct assistance, long on encouragement to continue along the path to capitalism away from communism. Decades of experience have proven beyond any doubt the poverty of an idea, the idea that progress is the product of the state. On the contrary, progress is the product of the people. Tomorrow, the president speaks to students at Karl Marx University, continuing his aid say to avoid directly challenging Soviet leader Gorbachev, whose own moves toward reform make him a hero here. Leslie Stahl, CBS News, Budapest. Even as a movement for democracy catches fire here in Eastern Europe, the mass revolt is still smoldering in China. Now, fugitive student leader Wuar Kaishi is in Europe, trying to put together a worldwide organization to keep the China movement going. In a moment, we'll have an exclusive interview with Wuar Kaishi. The other news of the day, including the death of Laurence Olivier, and more from here in Hungary. As we continue our special coverage of the president's trip and the new face of Europe, concentrating our coverage this week on the movement for democracy and freedom in Eastern Europe. Worth noting that spread through Europe now are student leaders on the run out of China and the recent showdown in Tiananmen Square. One of the would-be leaders is 21-year-old Huar Kaixi, who is at the forefront of student marches in China in April. And later, he was one of the leaders of the hunger strike in Tiananmen Square that turned into the mass movement for Chinese democracy. When Chinese communist authorities called the students in to lecture them on what was called their misbehavior, Wu'er Kaixi, in his hospital pajamas, breathing oxygen through a tube, suffering from the hunger strike, talked back. He told Premier Li Peng about the need for Chinese reform. The discussion ended when Wu'er Kaixi collapsed in a faint and was rushed back to the hospital. Wuar Kaishi later called for an end to the occupation of Tiananmen Square, but was voted down and lost his position of leadership among the students. But he regained it after the army stormed the square. He wound up at the top of the government's most wanted list. He escaped China and then put out a defiant statement, predicting the downfall of the old line, hard line communist Chinese government. We talked to Wuar Kaishi earlier today at a safe house here in Europe. I know that you want to be a, a, a bit secretive about it, but what could you tell us about how you got out of China and how the others got out of China? How, how is this working? <laughs> you are right. I have to keep it a secret to protect my friends, those who haven't got out yet. Like Fluenza asked us specifically to pass along his regards and his personal support for you and the movement. Uh, conservatively estimated, how many people do you think died in the wake of the army's crackdown in China. On the day of the massacre, I was at the square. At least over 2,000 people were killed on Tiananmen Square. More than 2,000. Are you fearful of reprisals against your family? Personally, I worry a lot for my family, but I hope the communist regime won't be so low as to persecute my family members. Could you suggest anything specifically that you would like President Bush and the United States to do? I don't want to say much, but there is one point I'd like to say, that is, necessary economic sanctions should not stop. And also, as to what some people said, economic sanctions would hurt the Chinese people, I don't agree with that. The moment that you and the other leaders had in Tiananmen Square was a breakthrough moment for democracy and freedom before the crackdown. 
how long before there'll be another breakthrough moment? Optimistically, two to three years. Conservatively, seven to eight years. The Chinese government and the Communist Party says that you specifically and other student leaders involved in Tiananmen Square were unpatriotic, that you were traitors to the country, that what you sought was anarchy and chaos in the country, and that you set China back perhaps as much as 50 years. I want to give you a chance to answer those very serious charges. The fact is that they themselves want to push back the advancement of democratic movement and they want to put the blame on the students. Under what circumstances could you, would you, return to China? When they gave me freedom to speak, even if they try me publicly, but it should be under the democratic system, not under the pressure of an illegitimate government. Thank you, Wu Kaishi. On the run, but out of China and safe for at least the moment somewhere in Europe. I'll have more news from Hungary in a moment. Back in Hungary now, we have moved inside the magnificent Budapest State Opera House. Theaters in many places around the world dim their lights tonight in tribute to Laurence Olivier, a towering presence on stage and screen who died today at his home near London. Lord Olivier, who suffered a variety of ills in recent years, was 82. Correspondent David Browning has put together a look at the life of an actor whose career was without parallel. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. How do you do? So good of you to cover such short notice. I'm Julius Edmond Sontora. I'm Marcus Vicinius Crassus. I met you. Laurence Olivier believed in always keeping audiences guessing. From Shakespeare to Sleuth, from London's National Theater to the sound stages of Hollywood, who would he be next? You may find the role of Madame de Pompadour is a little beyond your range. And your range is so charming as it is. He was already a legend in the theater when he hit Hollywood in 1939 to make Wuthering Heights. He remembered looking down his nose at the movies. I had heard myself saying, this anemic little medium can't take great acting. Can you imagine? And for 50 years after, he starred in every sort of film and play. Tell me. He did all the dangerous stunts in Hamlet himself. At least it looks real because it was dangerous. But you must really go for them, and they must really go for you. That's why that looks good. In real life, he married three times, including the actress Vivian Lee and actress Joan Plowright, who helped him in his later years throw off the bouts of depression and drinking and stage fright that sometimes bedeviled him. Why should I care? Of all his Why roles, Olivier liked the entertainer best, Archie Rice, the shabby music hall comic. Hollywood gave him three Oscars over the years. Great Britain gave him knighthood. His fellow actors simply called him the greatest of his age. Would you do anything over? I don't think so. One, is it, um, H.G. Wells had a wonderful line to somebody who asked him that. Do you believe in another life, Mr. Wells? And he said, he had a little thin, rather thin voice. He said, no, thank you. One life's quite enough, a little old H.G. Well, I think one feels like that. Housing Secretary Jack Kemp told a congressional panel today that he inherited, quote, a legacy of abuse and mismanagement, fraud and favoritism in certain programs when he assumed his post. Then Kemp talked about the future. Terrence Smith has our report. When I said, uh, when I first took the nomination from President Bush that I wanted to make HUD a high-profile agency, I don't think I had this in mind. Testifying in detail for the first time on the spreading scandal at his agency, Housing Secretary Jack Kemp acknowledged that the loss to the taxpayer from waste, fraud, and abuse in the last eight years could be as high as two billion dollars. It's a ballpark figure. It's a ballpark figure. I think six billion is way too much. Right. Uh, I think a billion would be too low. 
And for the first time, he publicly blamed the agency's problems on his predecessor and fellow Republican, Samuel Pierce. I think it was run uh, in shipshod fashion. I think there were mistakes made. Kemp insisted that his goal is to clean up HUD, not dismantle it, as some conservatives have urged. I want to work with the Congress to wage war on poverty and homelessness and despair. I am not out to wage war on programs. I'm not out to wage war on policy. The overriding job we have, I think, to do right now is to make sure that this does not become another case of the victims being further victimized. But the abuse continues. A new audit obtained today by CBS News shows that just one California mortgage company failed to turn over some $400,000 in payments to the agency. Terrence Smith, CBS News, Washington. The Coast Guard today said oil from the hull of the crippled tanker Exxon Valdez was the likely source of a 10-mile oil sheen off the coast of Southern California. Concern about that slick plus discovery of five flaps of steel hanging from the bottom of the tanker is expected to delay the ship's entry into San Diego Bay for at least several days. The Exxon Valdez faces repairs for damage it suffered when it caused the nation's largest oil spill ever. The United States bowed to pressure from Israel today and branded as terrorism the bus attack last week that killed 14 Israelis. Earlier, the U.S. State Department said it didn't know enough to say that, but Israel protested, saying this would give Palestinians a, quote, license to kill. Today, a spokesman in Washington said the U.S. still doesn't know if any group was behind the attack, but it did meet the criteria of terrorism. That word, of course, is politically loaded in the Middle East. The U.S. has agreed to talk with the PLO only on the condition that it has renounced terrorism. Today's events in Gdansk underscore the importance of that Baltic seaport in Polish life, a place of shipbuilders who have now given Poland new hope for a democratic ship of state. Bob Simon reports from Gdansk after the cheering stops, a once upon a time story with no guarantees of a happily ever after ending. Forty-five years of communism have not killed Poland's love of fairy tales. This is a story about a prince, a priest, and a princess. But the setting supplied by the socialists is far from Never Never Land. It is the legendary Lenin shipyard of Gdansk. Its giant cranes hovering over the Baltic like primeval birds of prey. It was a showcase of Stalinist economics when it opened in 1948. It is the birthplace of solidarity, the workplace of Lech Wałęsa. In 41 years, 922 seaworthy vessels have been built here. It's a shipyard that's sinking. Last October, the government declared it unprofitable, said it should be shut down, ordered state managers to start selling it off. Lenin is in liquidation. The men who build the ships are convinced the decision was political, close down the cradle of solidarity, as if that could stop the rebirth. The government is taking revenge on solidarity. That's why they hit this yard to split the movement and destroy it. Enter the worker priest, solidarity supporter, Father Henrik Jankowski. It was the work of God. While visiting the United States, I met Mrs. Barbara Johnson. Barbara Johnson, born Barbara Piasecka in Poland, emigrated to the United States, worked as a chambermaid for J. Seward Johnson, heir to the Johnson & Johnson fortune, married him when she was 34, and he was 76, inherited $500 million after he died. The priest brought the heiress to Gdansk to meet Lech Wałęsa. Lex said he was sad. His shipyard was closing. Barbara gave him a four-leaf clover and an offer of $100 million. It was Lex's lucky day. I thank God who has brought this most wonderful person, a person who lifted from our shoulders this terrible burden. And just in time, the yard's largest dry dock lies idle and abandoned, waiting for its ship to come in. 
70% of the yard's young men have left. We were not allowed to rise salaries above from year to year, uh, exceeding a certain level. And that was the main reason why we were losing the people. So the Lenin shipyard was destroyed by Leninist economics? You can say so. The men who worked the yards and struck for solidarity have wandered off to their own private ventures now. Computers, consulting, car alarms, clothing. Some are in Parliament, some are on City Hall. These ex-yardsmen, Yacheks of all trades, are restoring the city's old buildings. Solidarity is turning a corner from large state enterprises to small private businesses. But this one corner of the past must be preserved, they say. That's why Barbara Johnson has received like loyalty here, reviewing her troops, accepting the accolades of her subjects, followed everywhere by music and flowers and lawyers, floating a proposal that would give her a 55% share of the yards. I have faith in Poland, faith in the Polish worker, faith that the U.S. can do a lot for Poland. I am the first person who did it. West German and Swedish companies have also been showing interest. Labor costs here are less than 25% what they are in Western Europe, but the people's choice is clear. I personally would prefer the Americans to buy the yard. But what about the authorities? What do they think about the Lenin yards rising again on a tide of American capital? We need a foreign partner. So we, we, we do not see any mental obstacles. I think everybody has, uh, Polish people has, knows what to do. A morality play acted out amidst the gingerbread houses of Gdansk. And if one private American can do so much, people whisper, just imagine what the United States of America could do. Bob Simon, CBS News, Gdansk. From the Budapest Opera House, that's the CBS Evening News. We'll be here in Budapest all day tomorrow, covering President Bush in a Hungary on the road to change. Dan Rather, see you tomorrow. Good night. Revolution 89. France celebrates a rebellion past as revolution sweeps through the communist world. A special edition of 48 Hours from Paris, Thursday. This is CBS. Come on, right. With a speed calling from a southwestern bell telephone.